This episode of Hammerlock Podcast with Tyson Dukes is brought to you by Hammerlock Apparel. Visit hammerlockapparel.com today. On today's episode, we talk about calling matches in the ring, the role of the crowd in pro wrestling, and an all-time classic mullet. It's a double dose of Chris Benoit against Fit Finley. Let's go! What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. I'm Scotty D here once again with another episode, Hammerlock Podcast, episode number 11. And I'm here with our good, good friend, Tyson Dukes. How you doing, man? Hey, man. What's happening? I am doing all right. This Hammerlock Podcast thing is now we're breaking new grounds. We're past the 10. We're flying. We're, we're flying high. Uh, and things are moving. Things are moving. I'm, I'm, I'm excited about all the stuff that's coming out. As you know, me and Scotty are doing TikTok now. We're on TikTok. We're doing, <laughs> which is way out of my league when it comes to, like, I'm not going to twerk for you people, but uh, I'm oh, on come TikTok. On. Yeah, well, Scott, if you, if you want to join me, we can do this together. I don't know. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we got TikTok. We have Twitter. We have, we're, we're just steady in that course of trying to bring balance to an unbalanced profession. And uh, things, are, things are moving. We're doing all right. Yeah, tutorials, wrestling tutorials going up on YouTube all the time. So keep an eye out for that if you enjoy that type of stuff. Uh, those are, I like watching those even if I'm not training to be a wrestler. It's interesting to see exactly how you break that type of stuff down. So um, if you are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, hit the subscribe button, hit the little notification bell to make sure you get all the current updates. And uh, that's the background on what we're doing, what we've done in the little last little while. But going forward on today's episode, we are going to watch a man that Tyson always speaks very highly of, Mr. Fit Finley. Um, what made you pick this match we're going to watch? Maybe let us kind of give us some background on this if you have any. So today we got Fit Finley, as you said, and Fit Finley is one of my favorites both uh, as an agent and a coach and as a performer. Um, even his earlier stuff with World of Sport, he's a true heel. He's like one of the very – they got very few true heels. He's one of those guys. He's a, he's a definite dynamo. When it comes to pro wrestling, he's my guy. Um, he's just a, one of those guys that, like, it does very little uh, in the ring as far as fancy stuff. He doesn't do very much fancy stuff. But the dude is a tank. He's like an absolute tank. And everything he does, he does uh, with intent and actual precise um, motives to get it, get the, get that in there. So if his, if he's going to throw an elbow, it's going to be the best elbow on the show. Cause he's mean with it and he's not rushing anything. And um, that's kind of like, that's kind of like where I wanted to go with it. Cause we mentioned it on the Tyler black episode where I hit the fit Finley elbow on the top of his head. I do a lot of stuff and I'll, I'll go over a couple of things that he does that are very subtle but I, I do try to uh, incorporate it into my work because he's one of those guys that I really look up to. Right on. So if anyone wants to follow along with this one, you can find, we're actually going to do two batches today. Uh, the first one you can find on YouTube, uh, it is called Fit Finley versus Chris Benoit, WCW Saturday Night 1997. The channel is Rock of Hysteria. So while everyone gets that loaded up, um, anything else to, about this match in particular you want to line up for us or we want to just jump right into it you know what this wcw one isn't very long but that's a lot of wcw matches back then they had a lot of talent they had a lot of talent that they were paying and they were trying to showcase everybody um it's not very long uh it, there's not much of a like a big psych uh psychology driven story it's more of a what they call smash mouth wrestling. It's very grindy. It's very gritty. It looks ugly. It looks real. And it's, it's just, I love smash mouth style wrestling. And there's two in those two that are in the ring. There's no better. There's no better for smash mouth style wrestling. There mm -hmm. might be a few, but you'd be hard pressed to find anybody as good as Chris Benoit and fifth Finley together in a ring, just beating the tar out of each other. Yeah, right on. So let's jump into it. And then if we have anything you want to mention in between, we can kind of hit some of that stuff between the matches. So I'll count it down if you've got it ready. So we'll go five, four, three, two, one, play. 
So, of course, this is the old, uh, cool WCW entrance that looks like <laughs> yeah. a Terminator factory. I still kind of enjoy it. I know it's very cartoony uh, because, like, when you're having millions of dollars and you belong to Turner Broadcasting, of course, you can throw as much money into crazy special effects. Look at that outfit. And one <laughs> Fit Finley. Hey, Scotty, what do you think about that sweet Fit Finley mullet? <laughs> yeah, the hair is great. Uh, but that also, that one, one football shoulder pad and the leather jacket gimmick is hilarious too. Yeah, basically Mad, uh, Mad Max Thunderdome style uh, ring attire. Um, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't <laughs> understand it. I'm glad he dropped it and got the, the stick, the shillelagh when he went to WWE. But yeah. still. The, and this is probably my favorite Chris Benoit. This is the Chris Benoit that I uh, went and watched with that uh, black vest, red tights, that look right there. That's the one that uh, I decided, you know what? I'm going to be a professional wrestler. When my dad took me to a show, it was William Regal and Chris Benoit. And I was convinced that I was going to be a wrestler. And then when I watched that match live in Pennsylvania, uh, there was nothing else I was going to do in life. <laughs> that was my, that cool. was my moment yeah. right there. Right on. That was a WCW event? Of course. Yeah. What's that? That was a WCW event you saw in Pennsylvania? That was a WCW event. It was yeah. WCW. It was in uh, 97, just before I joined wrestling school. Cool. And here we go. Like, right away, they're talking about the angle between him and Raven, and of course. But now they're getting into it. Now, like, right away, strong, strong lockup. Fitz Finley and him are going to bull back to that corner, move to the other corner. And those Fitz Finley forearms are some of the most uh, stiff, Solid forearms in the business. They're fantastic. Um, tremendous elbow drop. See how he just takes his time and how Chris is feeding e each body part, like the safe areas, like the top of his shoulders, his full chest. Make sure that he doesn't hit him in the chin or in the lower back, but he's really bringing it. I love that spot. I love that spot too. Like Fit Finley or Chris Benoit comes out chopping, 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 and it ends with uh, uh, Fit just giving him a drop to hold. That is one of those subtle things that I will do because it's very wrestling driven is the drop to hold out of nowhere. Instead of just always going for a boot in the gut, it's nice to switch it up. And of course, he's just, just a solid, just everything. Watch, watch as he just drives into him with everything that he got. Sweet uh, uh, Tilt World Backbreaker by Chris Benoit. I love the Inseguri too. Did you notice that, Scott, on the cell? Yeah. Uh, Inseguri, like the cell, he didn't just bump over. He didn't do anything hokey. It looks real. looks like he actually got kicked in the head. That over-the-top spot there reminds me of uh, the podcast of Flair and Martel, the end of that yeah, match. You know what? Same, same exact cut type same. of spot. Same spot, and it's it's one of those spots that is it's hard to do because there's very few – uh, professionals that are like solid enough that you would trust to do spots mm -hmm. like that, like uh, a thing like that across the body over the top, because both guys have got to have solid control of what they're doing at all times to do that. And that's just missing nowadays. You just can't, you just can't do those kind of maneuvers with anybody because you run the risk of getting hurt, yeah. but like just, just great work. Right. This throw into the stairs here. looks bad. Not yeah, bad. That looks bad. Good. Oh, right to yeah. the top of the head. Yeah, right to the top of the head. And that's, that's, the, that's how Benoit used to be. Benoit used to do crazy, crazy stuff and put his body on the line and put his li body on the line for this business. He absolutely loved everything about um, this business. This was his business, and he, he was going to make it look the best. And, of course, even on the, their smaller show being the Saturday one, <laughs> he's uh, still going to hit his head on that stairs, man. Mm -hmm. Little double stomp to the guts, moves to the corner into a sweet European. Oh. Fitz also known for like all these strikes are so like it's a lot of meat on meat. You don't have to slap your leg as we do nowadays. Everything he does is um, real contact, and I, I that's missing too. Like a, a lot of guys will slap their leg or slap their chest on their offense. Why are you hitting yourself? Why not just hit that guy in meaty, safe areas where he can take a shot and people can actually see and register it being real? Mm -hmm. Especially now, uh, Scotty, you see stuff nowadays where, my God, if it looks like they're like uh, giving a full applause. Like people can, like they don't even try to cover it up anymore. It's like the, the idea of covering it up is completely gone now. Yeah. 
people just see it. Oh, I steal that too. You see that uh, 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 he throats him uh, across the apron like that, mm-hmm. where he pulls him out and drives his throat in the apron. It's all just – this is all Fifth Finley at Fifth Finley's best. If you notice, too, this uh, like he, he gives a little bit of um, the shine to Benoit off the start, but it's not very long because they don't have the time. So they get right to the heat, and it's pretty, pretty much he's just eating them up right now. Mm-hmm. Finley eats them up the whole time, and it's so believable. Even with that dirty, greasy mullet. <laughs> I don't know what I would love. You know what? I've never asked him like when I worked there, but I would love to have a minute with fit and ask him like, why, why, why good man? Why? Good <laughs> <sir>? <laughs> What's with that? That was the filthy, era of long hair. hair stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'd have right. long hair in that era. It seems so even if it's just at the back, it's long. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was, I was hunting down some uh, actual matches by, um, fit. And then I was trying to hunt down, uh, other ones just to see. And there's one with Brad Armstrong, and it should have just been the battle of the mullets. Both of them <laughs> yeah. had the greatest, slickest mullet ever. The mullet like Kentucky World waterfall Championship. style. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, doesn't want to take the back suplex. No, he ain't taking that German. He ain't German, taking yeah. that German. He's just elbows, elbows, solid elbows, big clothesline. Fitz got a great clothesline. He's got a, a tremendous uh body slam and this is it i do believe this is it right here so all it is is he just beats the hell out of him and out of nowhere and do you see that little fight where you think he's actually going to go to the ropes you think oh this match is going to be uh super long and super classic and then it ends right there and that's that is so great like i don't understand why we make this job so difficult now if there's a real fight it's only one punch will knock you out Mm-hmm. Or one guillotine choke will knock you out or cho- tap you out. I don't understand in this day and age where, where like all these kids have to make everything so difficult and do three million false finishes at the end of a match, like as, as if they were supermen. If they like have no, I am impervious to pain. Nothing hurts me. It's absolutely ridiculous. Like that is just that match right there is another reason I picked it is uh, just for that fact alone. Yeah. That they uh, go toe to toe, and it's hard. It's so hard. But then that finish, there isn't a need to kick out or have any false finishes like superplexes or DDTs or whatever. They just go straight home, and that's all it was. Benoit's in trouble. He's getting the ever living bejesus knocked out of him, and then he just pulls into that crossface or um, yeah, crossface, and then that's it. Crippled yeah. crossface done. Perfect, perfect match. Yeah. Good. Like, what's that? Without entrances, like five, six minute match. That's yeah, pretty good. Yeah, it's great. It's great, yeah. and that uh, and that goes to the story again of uh, what we were talking about before. A lot of people say you can't tell a story or you can't have a good wrestling match in uh, four to five minutes. The WWE gives enhancements uh, to shine, and I call BS on that. You can have a great match at any time. I don't like. Five minute matches. I'm not a fan of five minute matches. I'm I'm a cardio guy, so I like to be on a treadmill and watch matches and stuff like that. So my I like at least ten minutes so guys have the time to pace their stuff and and do it all and like not seem rushed. But that's one of those fine examples of guys that just don't rush. They just do their work. They're just content and like at a great pace. Looks real. It's intense the whole time, and they never they never miss a beat. It's just really really well done. Yeah, very good. All right. So second match we're going to look at on this episode happens to be the same two gentlemen, and it's going to be ten years later. Uh, we're going to jump to February two thousand and seven. So the second one you can also find on YouTube currently. It's a two-part match, so you're, or it's two, two different videos. Uh, so I'm going to have to get them both lined up here. Uh, I'll tell you how to find it. If you search YouTube for Chris Benoit versus Finley, SD, it's February 2nd, 2007, part one. The channel is Chris Benoit Videos. And then the second one, obviously, is the same thing, but part two. So uh, if you want to get those both lined up, and then we will just go one right into the other. I'll count down both videos so we can be at the same time. But that is what we're going to do next. 
Yeah, you know what? I picked this match because it's one of the, one of Chris's last ones with Fit, and it's still like ten years later. It's still the same style. They don't and they uh-huh. don't miss a beat. They don't miss a gear. It's still the same. So ten years later, these guys are still working the same way. Um, I, I just a testament to their work and to how solid they were in ring and able to do it, especially with uh, Fit retiring and then from active being an active wrestler to coming back to being an active wrestler. Uh, the only thing that I'm going to say right now before we get started is the finish. The finish is not not good. <laughs> it's just not my bad. Like you, uh, we talked about this the other day. I mean, Scotty's saying like. You know, you kind of make, you know, lemonade out of lemons kind of deal um, with that kind of a finish. You could tell that those guys would, I would just, just pin me. <laughs> you know what I mean, I don't, you know, but if you want to get your story across, I guess, um, I don't know if it was just lazy writing or like, yeah, it would be lazy writing just to um, have the boogeyman come out because the boogeyman's going to be at the end of this thing. And it's just, it's the, the, and don't, don't look at the ending and think uh, uh, like I want you to watch it from start to finish uh, and just ignore the the actual finish and the ending and just enjoy up until that point. Uh, like we said before, Smash Mouth style wrestling, like good professional wrestling. Yeah, because I mean, everything up until the ending is these two guys just that's what they're doing. And then the ending is out of their control as far as I is that accurate? Like they're just they're controlling everything and then the ending is what the writers tell them to do. Yep. Yep. Yeah. They got a time limit. They got a, like, they know when they have to go to break and all that stuff. They know all that stuff. So it's just the ending that they're looking for. So they know, they know their finish and that's, that's basically it. They know yeah. what they're doing for the finish. And then they just say, go out there, do it. And then wait for boogeyman's music to hit. And then it's like, then they have to, you know, play by the rules of TV, which, right. you know, I don't know. Like I could rant, I could rant with you on this <laughs> all day about how like TV is kind of like bastardized what we do. Yeah. Um, but again, it's just, it's just, it's just the way it is. It's just the climate of professional wrestling yep. with TV. Yeah. All right. Ready to jump into this one? Let's jump into this. Well, let's do it. So part one, we're going to go five, four, Three, two, one, play. So in 2007, um, I am actually, I was on a show, a SmackDown show uh, a week prior or a week or two. I do believe it's a week prior to uh, when Chris Benoit uh, had that tragic uh, uh, ending to his life and his family's life. And uh, I talk about it. Uh, with a couple of podcasts that I did for other people. And it was, uh, it was a bad scene. It was a bad scene. He was just not the same person. I had taken some time off. And when I had come back to WWE after being injured, uh, this was one of my very first times that I was like 30 pounds plus heavier in way better shape, had a giant beard, had a mohawk. I wasn't the dancey kid that you saw in that. Um, my previous stuff with Matt Hardy, um, and I worked Chuck Palumbo the night before for Raw. And then the next night I came here and was at a Velocity. And it was in London. It was in London, Ontario. And I just uh, remember Chris not being the same human being anymore. Just not, not, just never made real eye contact, never really. And me and him knew each other. We used to, I used to talk to him often because he's my guy. He's like the dude that I wanted to emulate and I wanted to be after that dancing thing had uh, kicked the bucket, but uh, it was never meant to be, I guess. Um, it, yeah, it's real tragic, tragic story. Yeah, like definitely. awful. If you haven't, if you haven't, uh, if you don't know what the Chris Benoit st- uh, story, try, check out Dark Side of the Ring. They have a whole two part series on it and it's really, really well done. Very mature. And it's a solid, it's a solid, uh, it's a solid episode. So check it out. The uh, it's funny to look at these two guys like the body styles you get to me like Fit Finley just classic barrel chested guy not I mean he's got some arms but he doesn't have giant biceps he's just a barrel and then Benoit's more like ripped uh, more of like a modern style wrestler it's, it seems like just two generations clashing here 
<laughs> it does. It does. And like Fit Finley looks like a fighter. Yeah. And I've always said that. Like you don't have to be a bodybuilder in this business. You just have to look like you can handle yourself. And that's I've always gotten on guys about their bodies, not to be and it's not to be an asshole about saying like get yourself in shape just to pick on them, but look like something, look like a fighter. Because Fit Finley looks like a guy that would thump the crap out of you just yeah. as much as Benoit does. Yeah. yeah. Same start There's of the a, match. Ten years later, basically the same start. Same start. Same style. Same uh, same way of going into things. Hard, hard lockup. Yeah. Nice tie up. Looks believable. They they don't miss a beat. The t- the pace is great. This is where it gets real nasty, though. <laughs> that if you smack had the volume the on, yeah, with the volume on, that is a loud smack. He, he gets them, and, yeah. and he busts his lip too. So he, he really tags him on that, like tags him hard on um, that crack in the face. Yeah, go like, back. If you're watching this thing, go back and rewind it later and get the, uh, that slap in the face. And he does it again, but he whiffs on that one. Yeah. If, uh, if you were looking for intensity, that moment right there, you just don't know what's going to go down because that looks real. Yeah. If you if it like that's what's missing from wrestling because they go into fake stuff or like they have Finley or like it would have someone that is in Finley's position then look at the crowd and do weird mannerisms and stuff like that he straight up did not take his eyes off of Chris and, and like didn't know it like it, the baff like his face looks baffled by it yeah it gives you that moment where you can be like was that supposed to happen exactly yeah. exactly and that's what's missing nowadays. Sweet single leg um, takedown into a leg drop, into a grapevine of the leg. He's got them all tied up. Um, these guys, like, and this is one of those parts, too, that I love, is these guys are just working. This is, they don't call stuff. They just, they're working. And if you take your time and you sell and you uh, go into your holds and you don't rush trying to reverse stuff, and you're just in the moment. This stuff looks way, 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 way better. Looks, looks like an actual called match. But these guys are, they have some idea of what they want, where they want to go. But it's basically this is, this is it. They're just calling it. Mm-hmm. There's a story about Benoit doing that too. I think it, I was there, and it was uh, him and Elijah Burke. I think I was there, or I just heard the through the grapevine, uh, him and uh, Elijah Burke. And Burke was super excited about working with Benoit. So he came right up to him and he's like, hey, man, I just, you know, I wanted to throw some ideas out there and uh, uh, to start my uh, my heat. I was just wondering if you were down with that. And he goes, Chris goes, nope. <laughs> he's like, what? <laughs> what? It's like, nope. He says, I let the people tell me when to take the heat or yeah. uh, what we do in the heat, which is – classic right that's classic yeah um that's work that's 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 a true professional wrestler not a guy that's going to sit back there with the script and uh memorize dance movements and uh gyrating and all the stuff that goes on but actual he's going to actually just go out there and perform the way he should perform and mm-hmm. it gives a real intensity gives a real drive to it a real sell um, a lot of things you do run the risk of miscommunications, but if you're solid and you're great at this thing, you work through miscommunications and people can't tell the difference. You just got to be brave enough to get out there and call some matches on your own. Like even at, like nowadays is the best time to do it with COVID being the way it is. And like guys working in the States still um, and having only 50 people at a show that's the perfect time to start calling your stuff guys and just getting out there and practicing it. Cause that's the best kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Just solid. Everything was solid, solid, solid chops. And that's my favorite part right there. That's what I'm loving right there. That's wrestling at its best. No, yeah. I'm not going to mess around. I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything crazy. I'm just going to misstep you on your drop. And then I'm going to go right into uh, pushing you into the stairs. Nothing fancy. Yeah. And that's the end of part one. It is uh, c- quick thing on that. Like when he just shoves him into the stairs there. So now in the both matches, Finley's hammer Benoit into the stairs. Both times are kind of what I would call like non-traditional ways to hit the stairs. Usually you see guys take it on the side, on the shoulder, whatever they have time to kind of turn into it. Like kind of like a body check and hockey or I can visualize taking it that way and it not 
just destroying you. But right. these two from Benoit, one was the top of his head. And then this one we just saw, he shoved him in backwards, which is to me just as a, again, watching it as if it was real, it seems way more dangerous. Like he could stumble, he could fall into the corner of the stairs. He doesn't know exactly how far back they are behind him because he's never turned around. Um, it, it just makes it look a little bit more dangerous. It, it Well, it, it for... It is more dangerous. <laughs> it definitely <laughs> is if you can't see what's coming. But anytime that you're adding implements of um, chairs, tables, uh, stairs, anything that's outside of the, the grappling side of professional wrestling, you run the risk of doing actual damage because you're uh, like, that's just the way it goes. Like you're using uh, inanimate objects that are hard and unforgiving to uh, do your business or work through your stuff. So uh, the best thing about Benoit is his, uh, his drive and his commitment to making his craft look uh, real and look super professional. And he was just uh, like a very serious about it as is, uh, uh, as is Bret Hart, as is stone cold. These guys are just, bled for this business mm -hmm. and so he he would take that like that why because that's the way you take things <laughs> when you're when you're serious about this business you don't take it fake you try not to make it look fake you try not to um dust it off like it's and like oh you just push you know where you see guys take the stairs and they push them they just yeah. push their arms yeah um i'm not saying to go out there and be reckless but I'm just, like the, he just gives a little bit, bit extra of himself in everything that he does, and yeah. that's that's why that's the beauty of his work is that that's one of the things that you love about Benoit is he's he's a hundred percent committed and a hundred percent driven, and he's always in gear ten all the time. Mm -hmm. One more quick question before we go to part two, the it's kind of going to lead into part two a little bit. He's he's selling his knee there that that you when know, he hit the stairs and his knee and then Finley's going to work the knee over for most of the rest of the match. If I remember, um, is that on the fly? You think just based on the way he hit the stairs, then he's, they're going to go that way. Or would that be something that was kind of discussed ahead of time? That is the, that is the one thing that they probably the finish they know. And that would be their, uh, because that's the spot where he goes for that basement, uh, yeah. style, low drop kick, uh, baseball slide style where he slides out of the ring and he moves out of the way. Yeah. So that would be their only thing that they're planning. Cause a lot of guys in, in this business, these old guys are older or been around a while. Um, they do that. They, they first go with, um, they don't talk about the shine. They don't talk about any of this stuff. They talk about what the cutoff is going to be. Okay. So that would be their cutoff. So they, he, Benoit would know that that was coming and where he was going to sell. And then the rest would be just uh, fit uh, working and taking uh, heat on the leg and then telling Benoit when it's time to fire up. Like he'd tell him, like, fire up, fire up. Or he'd open himself up. Even like those guys are even better pros when they don't even say anything. They just open up their bodies and the other guy knows, oh, okay, he's opening up his chest. Now I'm going to chop him. So that's, it's just, it's a lot. <laughs> Scotty it is such a lost art. Uh, these kids nowadays, I, I've opened myself wide, wide, wide open and then had to wait for a beat of five to nothing. So I'm like, well, okay, so you're not, you don't want anything. You, I guess you don't want to look like you're in this at all. So I'm just going to beat you up more. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a, it's a really, it's a very fine and um exact science and art to it and it's just it's just no longer here anymore that's another thing too if i ever got on uh, we, they talk about shows and stuff like that if i was ever um highlighted to do another big organization show no matter what it was i think most of my stuff i would just go in there and do it uh, that's where i'm the most comfortable and that's the the most reality-based stuff i'm I, I tend to if i got too many spots to memorize i just think about what i'm doing next instead of being in the moment so if there was ever someone just said hey man we want to bring you in uh to do something can you come down of course i would be down there but i think that i would i would have to just go out there and do it i'm not going to uh rehearse um dance steps in the back <laughs> yeah uh, all right let's jump into part two uh, enough dilly dallying around here so Assuming everyone's got it ready to go again, it's Chris Benoit versus Finley SD February 2nd, 2007 part two. 
So five, four, three, two, one, play. So right, once you come back into it, and I love, it, I still love that you count down from five. I'm glad that we're not going to switch that. <laughs> no, it's on. <laughs> I love it, but Bundy. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> People need time. So right away, you're, you're going to see him come into like a deep half crab, and I've seen some stuff online where guys have tried for a single leg crab or a Boston crab and they don't get deep. You should be right down in the bend of that knee. That's where the, that's where you, there's give in the leg. So that's where you get your deepest anchor in there and it looks the best. You get the most control. So as we've talked about before as well, these guys are so solid and everything looks so good and they're never off balance and it's because they control. <laughs> They're actually controlling the situation. He's not just going to grab that leg and hold it so Benoit can like kick him in the face all the time unless he's feeding for said kick in the face. It's not, it just doesn't look like uh, play wrestling. There's a lot mm-hmm. of stuff out there that if they are going to grapple nowadays, it looks like play wrestling. It looks like two kids that are uh, going through um, a re- like a play or something, like a fight scene, or a choreographed fight scene, mm-hmm. whereas these guys, you would just never know. You would think if you're just appreciating this for what it is, this is, this is just fine, fine work. This part here right? coming up is so good against the ring post. Yes. And that part is great too. As he like, this is the subtle nuances. Like Benoit doesn't know that he's going to the outside at that point uh, with his knee and how fit hooks it and goes underneath. But Mm -hmm. yet Benoit knows then as he's getting hooked just to go with the motion and just turn and go flat on his back, which is like he feeds properly. That's, that's the difference between uh, selling um, and getting positioned like like properly that's how that's how it's done right there that's like i don't have to flop you like you're not going to flop on your belly because you think i'm going to do something you're just waiting for a pull and seeing where the control is and then you move with where you, the, the force is where the pressure goes you just move with it yeah this is all like fit finley working this leg over and that cell is just you know what i mean that's just it's so it's so not seen anymore and i love it for this because i'm a huge fan i'm a huge fan of working over the leg it's one of my my best areas to work over like i don't work any body part on a human being it's not it doesn't really matter but that is my favorite like mm-hmm. doing the leg because i feel as though nobody can really do it all that well um so it makes me stand out even more mm-hmm now he's he's actually accomplished it he's actually got both legs over for that half crab uh fits sitting back on it could be sitting back on it more but um of course they're just trying to get a better facial and uh chris bamois up more looking like he's selling which is great visual which would make a great picture um if someone took a picture right there that's a great shot of him trying to push up out of that single leg Great selling. That is as believable as it gets right there. That's a believable sell. Now, question for you on grabbing the ropes. You mentioned before, like, uh, generally, the baby face shouldn't break with the ropes. In this case, is it kind of because it's so desperate that it's reasonable to do it that way? Exactly. Exactly. And that's the best part about this. Look at that. Uh, like Dragon's crew, like whip. Oh, Fit yeah. Finley. That's tremendous. He used to do that in world of sport and Lou used to look really tight because he used to go right underneath the leg. He'd catch it in the corner and go underneath. But you're right, uh, Scotty, this is um, past that point. So like when you're chain wrestling or wrestling off the start and the guy has a hammer lock, the baby face should never grab the rope. He should try to get out uh, using sports and using his athleticism and his strength and speed and all that stuff. But when it gets to the point where you want people to believe that you're legitimately hurt and it's near the end and it could be the, could be the end of the match, that's the best time to do it. That's the mm-hmm. best time to um, grab those ropes and show real desperation. That goes along with the same things we were talking about before, Scotty, of like, baby faces finding those ropes and hanging off those ropes. It's just, mm-hmm. it's actually the same. It's the same time to use it for the drama. Yeah. That like his selling on those, uh, on his, on his leg is just by far the best. Mm-hmm. Like just look now he stays in the center. He's going to stay in the center and fits going to do all the work for him. That's so good. He goes for a suplex. Of course he buckles knee buckles. 
Fitz up now. He's going to kick him. <laughs> mean. Yeah. Disrespect is funny. <laughs> just so mean. Yeah. Everything he does is mean. I just love it. Absolutely love it. Boom. Back 10 Boom. years ago there with that insecurity. There it is. <laughs> We're back to it. And uh, if you notice, it's the same realistic, beautiful cell. Sit, come, walks to the center. Look at the – now watch Fit take – this is an older gentleman. He's older than me here. And look at him take these friggin' German suplexes. This third one is top-notch. Watch. Boom. That's just, that's just great stuff. That's just great, great stuff. These guys have always been my favorites. Always, 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 always. I've always loved them. Uh, I like I like competitive wrestling though. That's where I differ from a lot of guys. I'm not into uh, the theatrics of stuff. I like like my Bret Hart's. I like my Chris Benoit's and my uh-huh. Fifth Finleys and William Regal's. Um, those guys are the guys I really enjoy watching. I always have as a kid. Even great, great. He misses that diving headbutt. But do you notice when he misses the diving headbutt, Chris Benoit just automatically goes to selling that leg? Because why yeah. wouldn't you? Right? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? And I believe we're coming to the end here because it's we're downhill. Some, yeah, it's coming in because that's nonsense. Of course, he's going to grab that turnbuckle, distract the ref. Do you ever notice how they've never cheap? They don't cheap out the ref here. They haven't. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I didn't see that the first time, so I was wondering why he did that. But now that gives the ref a reason to go into the corner. Yes, there. To uh, yeah. fasten that turnbuckle back on. Um, that's the way that he's doing it. Of course, this is the end of our match. Um, it's a great – the start of this is great. This yeah. is this is an all right at the beginning where he's just uh, – Hornswoggle's getting pulled under the ring. Um, what did they call him before that? Was it Little Bastard there? That's what or, they're calling him at this point, yeah. <laughs> yeah, not Hornswoggle. They didn't make a kid friendly. They didn't know who the dad was, I believe, right? And it was ended right. up being Vince I've, as far as I remember. Oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, there's TV for you, right? Yeah. That's TV for you. But that's um, a great way because nowadays, always, I'm just always saying nowadays, but I guess it's just it's power for the course, right? We're going to learn anything from stuff from the past. You have to incorporate it into what's going on now. Yeah. Um, we cheapen the ref. We make them look like idiots. If there's a real official and you treated them with such disrespect, you would like no one would win matches. No, <laughs> no, one, yeah. no matches would be over two minutes long because no one <laughs> abides by rules at all. Yeah, that's the idea. Is like heels are supposed to cheat but not get caught. Baby faces are supposed to s- stick by the rules. Of course, there's the finish. Boogeyman comes out, and he's under there, and that's the reason Hornswoggle couldn't come out and cheat with them and cost them a win. As uh, Chris Benoit, it's a schoolboy, and that's it. That's uh, like bloody faced Fit Fit Finley looking at Boogeyman. Of course, setting up that angle, and the reason why um, uh, the Boogeyman, you're like, why Boogeyman with uh, Fit? Fit is known as the guy. Um, to go to for working with new talent. So Boogeyman is not is not what we call the best um, uh, professional wrestler of all time. Let's just put it that way to be polite. <laughs> yeah. So, but that's when you're trying to build guys up. Fifth Finley is your guy because. First of all, he's simple. Uh, his offense is simple. It's not over the top. But yet everything he does is so realistic and so solid that you're going to put your young guys in there to learn from him and to be uh, everything to be done really, really well. And so you see it there. You see uh, with the boogeyman that uh, he's setting it up because now fit for the next little bit is going to give him the thumping of a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the same with Lashley. He did it with Lashley. He used to do it with a lot of, a lot of um, younger talent too. He used to just beat the hell out of them. Yeah. Of course, Hornswoggle won't go in the ring. What's what's the deal with that? I didn't finish that at the end of this. I think he's scared of the going under the ring now because of oh, yeah, what just happened to him under there. there. Boogeyman's not right. there anymore, but he's scared of under the ring now. It's, no, okay, not, okay, because I thought they had the little boogeyman. I didn't know if they had. The oh, little man, there. I didn't see that part. If there is one, but that's kind of where we get into like blending, like wrestling with TV writing, I guess. Right. It uh, yeah. So 
yeah there's there's your entertainment value and we can talk all day about we can we can you know uh, do the points card the like entertainment versus real wrestling like real professional combative style wrestling and like who drew more and what did better um to each their own i just know that to me if it's not if it, you make it look like a joke yeah, you eventually turn it into a joke and then once it's a joke and people hear that joke often enough they're no longer interested and that joke isn't funny anymore it's the same as like chicken cross the road type humor it only lasts so long it only has so much staying power whereas pro wrestling as in the sport the combat of it uh, can last forever if we really wanted it to just that's what we're trying to preserve yep absolutely um i got a question for you about trust in the ring so like you mentioned a little bit when you talked when they did the over the top spot there um, and obviously those guys have worked together a ton. We're looking at two matches, 10 years apart. So who knows how many times they've wrestled in those, between those 10 years. Um, what can you talk a little bit about the difference of how a match can go or what like, type of match you can put on when you're in there with somebody you've been in there lots with, you trust them, you under, know what they can do. They know what you can do versus getting in the ring with somebody for maybe the first time or someone that you don't know their background as much, um, you know, at a spot show or something like that, where you're not as comfortable in the ring. What, how does that affect the match? Well, this is what they talk about when they talk about timing um, with, with a certain human being, like a, a, they have chemistry, timing and chemistry come up because guys that have natural chemistry together, like your steamboats and flares where they never miss a beat. They knew what each of each one was thinking at all times is, that's that's just um that comes with sometimes like you can have one match with a guy and you have that you have that instant chemistry where you just know that oh tonight's going to be a good night it's going to be an easy night um and then there's other times where you don't trust guys and it's kind of you can make it you can still make it great it's not that you can't make it great so don't a lot of guys will think like, oh, well, then if I had to work someone new, then, you know, is, is, if it, what am I supposed to do? Is it going to suck anyways? Or No, it's just once you get to know somebody and know how they move and how they uh, go into things and you can eventually trust them. I never trust a guy right off the start. If someone tells me they're going to give me a pile driver, I'm not – typically the one to say no but in some cases like with moves like that yes i'm going to say no thank you we can get get to this ending some other way um because i just don't know but once i'm in the ring with that kind of, that person and they give me a body slam and a drop kick and it's light and airy uh, like i might even change on the fly and I'm like let's do the pile driver i'm good with the pile driver let's do it mm -hmm. uh it's just because you don't know you just don't know and especially nowadays because there's way more guys they let like everybody and their grandmas and their their kids and their you know step kids and all that stuff they've let into the business so everybody's in the business because it's you're trying to make business by uh opening up the business to everybody so it's exposed more and more all the time so you have all these this plethora of wrestlers you don't know who's trained well and who's not trained well until you actually get in there and lock it up with them and so sometimes it's uh, best to be cautious, but yet uh, still commit a hundred, hundred percent to what you're doing. Just, you just got to be very selective of what you're doing and what you're taking and how you're getting into things. If I know, like I, I do it sometimes and I get, I, it's an, it's a problem because I try to give too much. I had one kid in Newfoundland uh, very eager to work with me. And so we, I came to this, came to the rock and was well, I was there in Newfoundland and we had this match and I was planning all out and he, he showed up late. He was with his girlfriend and showed up late. And, um, it just, he was nervous, but then instead of just saying it, he was nervous and talking it through with me a couple of times. He just like, we, we went over it maybe twice and we went out there and he was so, anxious and so uh, nervous and so tight that he he lost his wind and he's a skinny little guy he lost his wind after two minutes 
Mm-hmm. And then I just try to keep giving them more stuff. But like looking back at the tape, I'm like, God damn it. Like it just makes me look real bad trying to make this kid look good. I should have just beat the ever living tar out of him and just called it a day. Just, uh, just, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with kind of eating a guy up, maybe giving him a little bit and hoping for the best, but not everything has to be a friggin' five star classic match where it's back and forth. You can get a lot more out of just heel work or just plain selling and just um, have something, a storyline come up later on uh, through, through, through the, through whatever promotion or whatever your story you're trying to tell. Mm -hmm. So uh, unfortunately the Dave Meltzer thing, I'm not a fan of Dave Meltzer as everybody knows Um, this five star doing five star matches and four star matches is complete utter bullshit and uh one of the like i hate i hate the five star rating because now guys are just out there um for themselves and just trying to have five star matches instead of uh being what they're supposed to be and that's respecting where they are in the card being either first match or um the one before intermission or one after intermission, because every single one of those matches is very, very important and is a different, is a different style and a different way of going into things. It's not your main event match, but it's certainly very much as important as your main event match that's, that you're leading up to. But instead of following the rules and the guidelines given to them in the ways of how matches should go on, they try to steal the show and they try to have a main event match off the first match or the one before intermission or even the one after intermission, which is so stupid. And it's like, you're no longer about professional wrestling. You're not in it for the love of wrestling. You're in it for the love of yourself and to get yourself over. And I can't have any of that because I'm passionate about wrestling, wrestling first, your own nonsense second. And like this five-star thing, if it was never around, I, it would be a better better world. Better world for movies, better world for wrestling, better world in general. If there wasn't some kind of structured uh, senses of how things were supposed to go, which is my rant of the day. Nice. I knew there was one coming at some point. That was great. Um, <laughs> you mentioned... Uh, during the match there, Dark Side of the Ring, the Chris Benoit episode. Some people may know, uh, some may not know. You were actually the person playing, in this case it was acted, Chris, as Chris Benoit in, the, in that Dark Side episode. Um, anything, any cool stories from that? How did that come about? Uh, how was that experience in general for you? That's my, that's my actually my second taping with Dark Side of the Ring. I'm on their very first pilot episode where I play Dutch Mantel. I'm a very handsome Dutch Mantel and very <laughs> jacked. Um, don't tell Dutch though. And then I, I, I got the call back. They wanted me to play and they specifically wanted me for the role of Chris Benoit. Cause I have the same uh, style, same stature. I'm the same height. I'm uh, not the same thickness anymore, but I look, um, if you have it all shaded as it is in the, in the TV episode, uh, I, I got a lot of attributes that look the same. Like I look a lot characteristics Mm -hmm. of Chris Benoit. I have them. So they wanted, uh, they actually wanted me to do it. And how I got it is I worked for a, a company in Toronto and the producer, Evan, he was on these, he was at this show scouting out talent. And so that's how I got the Dutch Mantel role, which then led into the Chris Benoit role. And the Chris Benoit one was two, um, two episodes. It was a lot of work. It was, it was supposed to be four days long, but it was only three because I had to go to Montreal. So they pushed it to um, condense everything to three days. It was, it's a, it's a lot of work. It's a lot. It's they're long, long days, and it's a lot of work. But it was it was such a blast to do. The only the, the the best start of it is Jason, who's the director, and Evan are huge wrestling fans. So they just we chatted up all the time when we're there, just talking about different wrestling matches and stuff we like and all that stuff. And it's not really the Benoit one because they know a lot of the Benoit story and nothing really. And I was just an honor to 
you know, be able to be a part of it and play the role of a very tragic and tortured human being near the end. Um, but the first ever pilot episode, I knew this thing was going to be great because it's just the way it was shot and all this stuff. And the, I could see that they just put everything into it. But then the thing that really sold me on it is they had Barbara Goodish, who is Bruiser Brody's wife and Barbara absolutely despises professional wrestling it has nothing to do with professional wrestling whatsoever hates it hates everything about it these two dudes <laughs> actually got barbara to sit down with them and do an interview about her husband wow. which blows blows my mind if if people really knew um how like how extremely crazy that is how like how how i don't know how they convinced her but uh barbara goodish is not a fan of pro wrestling and has nothing to do with it and these two dudes are geniuses because they actually got her to sit down and interview about her husband uh, her late husband, that is. Mm -hmm. And yeah, man, I, I knew it. I knew as soon as I saw that interview, I'm like, you know what? This thing is going to blow up. And it has. Uh, the, ben the Benoit episodes, the two episodes, are still the highest viewed. Because um, it's just a crazy story. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a, a dark side of the ring. If you haven't uh, had a chance to watch it, I suggest you watch it. Because it's... Uh, just amazing it's amazing tv you don't even have to be a wrestling fan if your wife or your girlfriend or significant other is not a wrestling fan it doesn't matter because they'll they'll get kind of drawn into just this crazy story of crazy characters and crazy life and how we live like cowboys and rock stars and it eventually is the end of us and our demise at a lot of in a lot of cases yeah I was going to mention that exact same thing that like you don't even have to be a wrestling fan. The, like when I saw the first one, it was, I was like, this is amazing. Um, and I watched the Ben one last night, had my girlfriend watch it. She's not a wrestling fan at all. And she was just sucked in like the drama involved and just the tragedy of some of these stories is just so captivating. And it's just like the, the tragic story, just there's something about it as a human goes all the way back to who knows like shakespeare and even before that we just love tragedy stories for some reason and like the benoit one has it all it's sad like it's just insanely good stuff the vice guys do a tremendous job um my favorite episode was the brody one uh and i just can't recommend that series enough dark side of the ring if you haven't seen it check it out you will not regret it i promise you that it uh just top-notch stuff for sure Anything else you want to mention about either Mr. Finley or Mr. Benoit before we sign off for the episode? Uh, you know, I, I just, I, we might as well just let their work speak for itself and just, yeah. just that. Um, I've had a few people say, Oh, I'm not a big fit Finley fan. I'm like, well, stop looking at like the hornswoggle deal and the stick that he brings to the ring and just, if, if if you really want to be convinced, watch some of his stuff in World of Sport where he's like a legitimate badass heel and just watch watch that guy actually stir a very proper English crowd into a frenzy because uh, Fit was the man for that job and he did it very, very well. He's mm -hmm. so good. Um, I'm still, like I said, we had that, we did the thing where he beat up Sylvain Grenier. There's lots of interviews with him talking about people asking him at the bar if wrestling was fake or real. Check that clip out because it, 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 you'll just appre appreciate just a, a journeyman like him way more if you check this stuff out. He's just, he's he's the guy that I would love to emulate in life. You know what I mean? He's like <laughs> yeah. my, He's like my spirit animal that's an actual human being. He lives it, for sure. Yeah. One last question here I wrote down. I forgot to ask you before we get going, uh, and then I'll let you go for the day. We, you mentioned about Benoit saying um, he didn't want to plan any spots. He said he lets the crowd determine the heat or whatever the, uh, the case may be. But now, with COVID-19 going on and no crowds or very limited crowds, um, what kind of effect does that have on the matches? Like there's no uh, pro wrestling. There's, there's a few professions in the world where the crowd plays a major role in it. One being maybe the biggest one being pro wrestling. 
uh, stand up comedy is probably the other one that I can think of off the top of my head where the crowd plays a big role in what actually happens in the moment. You play off the crowd a little bit and with no crowd right now or very little crowd, how is that as a, as a professional wrestler in the ring, how does that affect you when you're trying to do stuff based on the crowd? And there isn't one. So the hardest crowds you'll ever be in front of are not your typical 18,000 people that I've been in front of. Um, it's not your 2000 that I've been in front of. Like, it's not going to be those massive crowds, the hardest and the most nerve wracking situations ever is in front of your 25 people mm-hmm. or your 30 people or your that like that this case let's say 50 people and that's usually your hardest that's the those most nerve-wracking uh situations for any wrestler because now it's like very few eyes and all those very few eyes are on you when you have thousands of people people are distracted and people just go with the flow so if there's they're like sheep and i hate to say that but like when people get together they turn into sheep so they just follow if you do the wave every one of these dudes does the wave uh it's it's funny how human beings have to stay connected to each other even if they're not with that person so if a chant starts they'll all start chanting especially nowadays everybody wants a freaking chant um <laughs> that being said um this is the way it goes in in um in wrestling, the hardest crowds are going to be your very few because there's going to be, they're going to be less distracted by each other, and they're going to be more eyes on you. Uh, so this is these are the cases where you have to keep your stuff so extremely tight and solid, and a little bit snug so that they can they can actually see it, and you can still catch them. I've had matches in front of people. My worst crowd, my worst crowd was eleven people. During a, during a snowstorm in North Bay oh. uh, is one of the hardest ones that I've ever done. Uh, 11 people. Imagine doing that. But still, <laughs> yeah. the, the show must go on. There's 11 yeah. people. We're going to do this show. But I still I was still able to uh, draw, uh, pull them into a match and uh, have people react to it with only those 11 people. It just means that there's less there's – less, uh, room for error because once you have a little bit of error or things don't look solid or things don't look great then uh, things are going to fall apart and people are not going to be with you so you have to it's just it's just uh keeping a, a more solid more with it than you would naturally normally uh because that thousand people like i said or ten thousand people there is room for error and, and like when you make a mistake no one really notices it because everybody's kind of eating popcorn making noise and stuff like that so yeah, that's it's weird, but you can still it, people are still the same. You can still pull them into it. Mm-hmm. It just it takes more concentration, I think, on the fifty than it does the thousand. Interesting. Right on. Well, that'll do it for this episode. Thanks everyone for listening. Really appreciate it. As always, you can send us any comments, questions, feedback to hammerlockpodcast at gmail dot com. Once again, check out Dark Side of the Ring if you haven't seen it. Also, check out Hammerlock apparel.com for the greatest the most comfortable the most the, the best fit if you're looking for oh my god scott we have such great <laughs> stuff online that um right now like our sweatpants our sweatpants alone and the men's shorts i'm always wearing the men's shorts or the men's sweatpants are so comfortable and like like i had them made uh, for me specifically, I wanted people to be able to do squats and stuff. I uh, like you. Do, you can wear it as gym clothes, but you can use it as like sitting in the house clothes. They're still they're comfy. They they look great. Um, but the the best part about them is the comfort level uh, and also the gift. So the fit on them. So I I can go into a full squat and never have to pull the back of my waistband up after every squat which is so frustrating for both the men and women we have a woman's line as well of like crop tops and sweatpants like a cozy set i'm telling you it's just the best stuff ever i got it like we got to push to the moon i wish more people could actually um see the stuff put it on and wear it because i they'd be convinced and want it want more of it but yeah yeah it's great stuff 
right on. So check that out. Uh, you can, again, if you're on watching and listening on YouTube, leave us any questions, comments down below. And like I said, hammerlockapparel.com, hammerlockpodcast at gmail.com. Tyson, you can find him on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all those things at Tyson Dukes. And until next time, catch you later. Later.